Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Uh, we are back again for week two of the Canadian Whiskey Certification, joined, of course, by Dave Mitten, Gina Fawcett, and Ricky Ramirez. Um, this week is all about uh, production. So we're going to go through the ins and outs of grain intake all the way to uh, distillation. Um, we'll explore the ins and outs of how Canadian whiskey is made, how the production style differs from North American whiskeys, and what makes Canadian whiskey such an innovative spirit category. Um, but you already knew that because that's the class description. So um, we'll get to that in a, mo in a moment. Uh, but first, make sure that you like, subscribe to Portland Cocktail Week, both on Facebook and on YouTube and Camp Runamuck. Um, that's where more classes like these can be found. Um, and then we're also, again, joined by Ricky Ramirez, who is our Spanish translator. Um, so just like last year, uh, if you are taking this class in Spanish, if that's your preferred language, Ricky is here to help. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, you can put those in the chat and Ricky will get them translated for you uh, by Dave and Gina. Um, and then also just any questions generally, drop them in the chat. Um, we'll be going through a tasting the latter half of the class. Um, so tasting notes, comments, anything you've got put it in the chat um, because we love interacting with you at home. So um, looking forward to getting into the class. I am going to toss it over to Dave and Gina. Thanks, Liz. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I'm happy to be back. I know Gina is. I know Ricky is. It's good to be here. Um, Kicking off from last week, history. I hope you took home a lot of information. I saw, I don't think I saw them all, but I saw a lot of posts on Instagram and Facebook. And you guys were doing some incredible stuff. So we were kind of laughing in between of how well I put together a lot of your posts are. It's very impressive, especially from a guy who like can hardly turn on a computer. Um, we're really excited. <laughs> She's laughing because it's true. Um, we're really excited for today because this is one of those uh, things where this whole course was developed from this. So many misconceptions of Canadian whiskey, as I've said before, one of the world's most misunderstood spirit categories, perhaps just whiskey categories. Um, but we always hear so many funny things like Canada doesn't have rules or you're allowed to do this or you can't do that. And, you know, at the end of today, I hope you'll all kind of roll your eyes at those comments too, because you're going to find out that is just not true. Um, we'll have a little more time today to talk, get into things, but I should hand it over to Gina. Professor Fawcett, you want to kick it off? All right, let's kick it off. Um, yes, so today we are going to cover whiskey production in Canada specifically. There's a lot of similarities um, to, you know, popular North American whiskeys that you know, like bourbon and rye, but there are some standout differences as well uh, that a lot of people don't know. And you will leave here today uh, with that knowledge. And for our 100 students, our certification students, tomorrow in our expert workshop session, we will have the uh, distillery manager from Hiram Walker, Amy Levesque. Uh, she is amazing, and she's going to take you on a much deeper dive than we are today. Today, we're going to cover uh, kind of broad category stuff. So let's go. Here we go. Uh, right here is a photograph, obviously, of the Hiram Walker Distillery. Part of it. It's as much as we could capture in this photo, that's for sure. But it is a massive uh, facility, a, a massive distillery. And the reason we're pointing this one out specifically, A, they make all the whiskeys that we're tasting in this course. Uh, B, you know, they are a massive distillery. Hiram Walker has the ability and the scope uh, to do many different styles. And so we are able to capture a lot of video footage and really take you inside the distillery and show you those processes that are happening in a lot of distilleries across Canada, um, but because we have access to Hiram Walker with our brands, uh, we are able to show you that. So just to give you a little more on what we'll be covering today, <clears throat> starting with grain intake and milling that grain into a flour, that's going to give us a grist. 
We're gonna take that uh, to cook with some other ingredients, make ourselves a mash, go to the fermentation tanks and add some yeast. There we're gonna come out as a beer, or our product will, as a beer. <laughs> uh, taking that beer into distillation, different styles of distillation. Now we're gonna have a spirit. Remember, Canadian whiskey has to be aged a minimum of three years, so we do not have a white whiskey in Canada, we have a spirit. Uh, then go into maturation to make it to make a whiskey. And then we might bl blend it, you know. Uh, the Hiram Walker Distillery, again, to show you scope, is one of the largest distilleries in North America. And we have a video here just to show you some stats and the scope of the distillery. So here we go. All right, so there were a lot of stats that we just took you through. You don't have to memorize those stats. We're really just trying to show you, again, the scope of the facilities. Um, just to go over a few, grain intake, we have 19 grain silos and taking in about 100,000 metric ton of corn every year and 10,000 metric ton of rye. We are using a hammer mill to grind that grist down into, or that grain, I should say, down into a grist, which is like a coarse like flour. And you'll see that in a little while. When we get to fermentation, and you'll see uh, some video of this, this is a massive room. Uh, there's 39 fermentation tanks that stand four stories high. We can never get them all in one shot uh, because the room is so big. But you'll see what we're talking about in a little bit. And then styles of distillation that we're going to go over today. Uh, single column distillation, much like most of your bourbons or rye are going to be made. Uh, double column distillation. A column still into a pot distillation. 
Uh, and we're distilling at Hiram Walker about 180,000 liters every day. To maturation, we are aging uh, 1.6 million barrels, and that is also every day. So we're, you know, putting on a truck about 11 to 1300 barrels, taking them to be dumped. And we are filling about 1,100 to 1,300 barrels every day and taking them back to the warehouse to age. So at all times, really, there are 1.6 million barrels aging. Okay, so let's talk about our ingredients, the beginning of the process here. Remember from category regulations, we make whiskey from corn, wheat, rye, barley, cereal grains, right? Any cereal grain. Now, this big take home about Canadian whiskey production is that each grain is going to be produced separately. 100% corn is going to be milled, cooked, fermented, distilled, and aged. And then we have a 100% corn whiskey aging in the warehouse. Same for wheat, rye, barley, you name it. So we've got all these different 100% grain builds aging in our warehouse. And then it's our master blender's job to create the recipe of how those grains go together to create a flavor profile. So what are those grains giving us? When we look at corn, we're really getting those sweet, creamy notes. Wheat is going to give us more toasty, bready notes. Uh, rye is going to give us those big, bold spice notes, uh, baking spice, pepper. And then barley is going to give us a little bit of a nutty character. The grains at Hiram Walker, for the most part, are sourced locally. Local Ontario farmers is where we're getting our grain from. And, you know, that is great to say and put it all over our marketing materials. Um, but it's really not for marketing. It just, that's great to source locally. It's really economics. You know, it's, it's expensive to truck grain clear across the country. So we try as much as we possibly can to get um, our grain from local Ontario farmers. So what happens to the grain? Here comes a truck right now. Uh, we've got a truckload of corn and it drives in and this probe goes all the way to the bottom of the truck. And it's going to take samples of this corn from different layers throughout the truck. This is so that there can't be some faulty grain kind of layered in and hidden. Um, we're going to get a few different samples at different layers. They're going to bring those samples into, this is Alice. She's who we would call our gatekeeper. She's the one that's going to run some tests as quickly as she can, certainly under an hour, uh, on that grain through several different types of equipment. And Amy's going to talk about that for our 100 students tomorrow a little bit more in depth. But she's definitely testing size of kernels, um, making sure they're consistent. She's testing how they are going to grind down into a grist. She's testing, you know, how they're going to cook, how they're going to mix with different ingredients that we're going to add later. Uh, she's testing for certain chemical compounds that we don't want to see. But the biggest test she does, and one of the most important tests she does, is with her human nose. Uh, and she is smelling the grain for a compound called geosmin. And this is really like a, it smells very wet, damp basement, wet cardboard, you know, type of smell. If she accepts a truckload of grain with geosmin, we cannot distill it out. So after we distill that whiskey and it ages in the warehouse, 10 years later, we just wasted a whole bunch of time and money on that batch because we cannot distill that compound out. So she can reject a truckload on that alone. And she certainly has, she is doing all of those tests behind bulletproof glass, because you can imagine uh, these farmers, this is their lifestyle. And when you reject a truckload of grain, um, the, the conversation can get a little heated. Uh, however, they can go down the road, there's an ethanol plant, that has different quality standards for the grains, and they can uh, try to sell them there. So we're gonna make a mash. What's going into our mash? Our grains. At Hiram Walker, it's corn, wheat, rye, barley, 
malted rye, malted barley. Only one, though, into our mash. But that's what we're making at Hiram Walker. Now, here's that hammer mill I mentioned. This is the machine that the grain's going to come in through the top. It's going to grind it down into that grist and get a nice coarse-like flour that you're going to see flowing through Dave's hands right there. So you see kind of the consistency of it or the texture of it a little bit. Now, we're also going to en add enzymes uh, here, mostly exogenous enzymes. And what that means is enzymes that are cultivated, much like yeast is, um, but they don't come from inside a malted grain because we're mostly producing corn and rye and we're producing some wheat and some barley, et cetera. But for the most part, we don't have malted grains in our batches to give us those, um, those enzymes. So we have to get them elsewhere and add exogenous enzymes. What are those enzymes gonna do? What's the point of them? Well, once we start cooking and the starch starts to break open, which you'll see in a little bit, uh, these enzymes can go to work on these very large starch strains, like 10,000 dextrose units, okay? and start breaking them apart into more digestible units for the yeast. Water's going into this mash, okay? So our water at Hiram Walker is coming from the Great Lakes watershed. You know, Windsor is right uh, on the Detroit River there, and we're pulling that, uh, that water right from that source. Backstillage, or some might call it sour mash. Now this is a very popular uh, way to make especially North American whiskeys. And really what this does is you're taking kind of the sludge or the leftover grain after distillation that's kind of left at the bottom of the still. It looks very porridge-like. And you're taking a bit of that and putting it into the next batch at this part of the process. And what that's gonna do is bring our pH levels, balance those out to where we want them and keep our batches consistent from one to the next. So this is called backstillage or sour mash. Um, it's not regulated that you have to or can't, you know, can or can't do it. Um, most, like I said, most North American whiskeys do. Not all, certainly. Um, you'll see some sweet mashes. Tennessee whiskey tends to market it. They like to market sour mash as part of their process, but most bourbons, most ryes, most Canadian whiskey is using this process as well. And then we're also going to add nitrogen. Um, this is something a lot of people do, not everybody, um, but a lot of people don't like to talk about it. We d we're not sure why, but it's something that we certainly do at Hiram Walker, and we do it at different parts during the cook, uh, making that mash, also during fermentation. And what it's helping us do is get the most out of our yeast, the most yield, helping them grow, thrive, multiply. So then therefore more alcohol at the end of the day, our yield of alcohol can be higher. And because we've really honed in on when and how much nitrogen to add, uh, we're able to get our corn whiskey uh, after fermentation up to between 15 and 17% ABV. So a lot higher than you'll see a lot of whiskeys coming between 8 and 10% after fermentation. We're, you know, really maximizing the yield that we're getting out of this. And then we have our mash. So there's our ingredients. And now we're going to go just show you these going into the premix tank. Than, than the cookers and what that actually looks like. So this is the premix tank, and this is sort of the process uh, that this liquid is going to go through up to our batch cookers here. So our, this is the back and the tops of our batch cookers. They're pretty large, um, but you're going to see the fronts of them as well. And this is what's going to cook our batch. This is where we're going to bring it up to temperature, start opening those starch strains up, uh, let them kind of pop open like popcorn kernels and let those enzymes start to go to work. All right, so let's get into cooking and fermentation a little more detailed. So here's that starch I was talking about, and this is called the gelatinization of starch, okay? It's gelatinizing. 
And as the temperature goes up, now this is starch under a microscope. As the temperature goes up, the starch is swelling. And then it gets so big that it, it finally, like I said, burst open, almost like a popcorn kernel, okay? And then that gives access now that they're popped open, these enzymes are like, all right, I can go to town and do my job, which is chopping them up into much, much smaller units so that the yeast can take them in. This is food for the yeast, this starch, okay? So now there's sugar molecules, food for the yeast, and then the yeast is going to produce some wonderful flavor components for us. So we're going to fermentation. Here is that massive fermentation room that I talked about. 39 fermentation tanks. These are the tops of them. Um, you'll see the bottoms of them as well right there, kind of looking up, but they are four stories high. And here's where uh, the yeast is going to be added. So all of that, you know, mash flows into these fermenters. And he's gonna open one of these up right now and add a powdered yeast, a dry powdered yeast. Once he does that, the yeast is gonna start, start to go to work, multiplying, eating the, the sugar, multiplying, growing, and extracting, letting go of. Now, most people know that yeast is gonna give you alcohol and carbon dioxide. And this process does get, it produces a lot of heat. It's gonna be bubbling but it is also gonna produce flavor components. So here's where we start to control our flavor down the road. Yeast is gonna give us fruity notes, floral, green grassy notes, soapy notes, and sulfur notes. And there's Amy, our distillery manager, and Dave. And she's just pulling a sample of beer up uh, so you can see it. It's really bubbly, right? That's from all the activity um, that the yeast is doing, eating that starch, multiplying, and releasing all of these components at the bottom, plus heat. So there's that distiller's beer, and that's what that looks like going into the still. Okay, so let's then jump to, there we go, distillation. We're gonna look at three different styles, like I said. Um, first is single column distillation. So this building here is, where we house our single column still. Right there it is, it's five stories high, so it's hard to get the whole thing in one shot. Uh, it is 100% copper. It kind of looks like it's, it's steel on the outside, um, but actually it's just wrapped in insulation. Okay, so pe it just prevents danger, people getting burned, because these stills get very, very hot. But you see all those doors, those circular doors, on each of those doors sits a copper plate, okay? And on those plates or in those plates are, are little holes. And you'll see this in a minute. Um, but, but the beer is gonna go in up toward the top and the steam is gonna come up from the bottom. So at each plate, as the steam rises up and the beer flows down, there's kind of a mini distillation happening. And so there's different temperatures at each plate and you're, you're developing different flavor compounds. And when we recorded this, uh, Dave was at the distillery and luckily for us, they were cleaning out the still. So Amy's opening this up here for us so you can see inside, which is rare because you, the distillery has to be shut down <laughs> uh, when this happens. But now you can see, see that plate with all those little holes? So that beer is just going to seep down through those holes while the steam makes its way up. And through each layer is kind of, like I said, a mini distillation developing different flavor compounds along the way. Now, copper, I mentioned copper, and this still is 100% copper. Copper plays a very important role in distillation. And not all stills are the same. Not all stills are 100% copper. But what it does is remove those sulfur notes that the yeast produced. So I don't know about you, but I don't really want to taste sulfur when I go to have a sip of whiskey. And not many people do. And so that is the job of copper. It's going to adsorb uh, the sulfur notes 
turn them into copper sulfate, which is that, you know, if you ever see like a copper roof over time, it kind of turns like a light blue or turquoisey color. That's copper sulfate. Okay. Uh, and so this still needs to be cleaned out once in a while. A couple times a year for us, uh, we'll shut down and clean that out. But this is what those plates look like on the inside. And so at the end of the day, after a single column distillation, you're going to end up with a full bodied whiskey retaining most of your grain character. So if it's corn, you're going to retain most of those sweet, creamy notes. You know, rye, you're going to retain most of that spicy, big, bold, maybe some floral notes in there. Retaining most of your yeast character. So nice, big, bold flavor here. Fruity, floral, green, grassy, soapy notes. And, but not sulfur, hopefully, because we had 100% copper. So we're really removing a lot of sulfur notes here. And we're bringing this up to about 70% ABV at the end of this distillation. Now we're going to look at double column distillation. So first we go through that still we just looked at. And now we're going to take that liquid, condense the vapors down into another liquid, and take it over to another column still. So this is our second column distillation. You see that still, we actually can get a full scope of it. Again, it's five stories high. It's a little bigger in diameter uh, than the first still. And what double column distillation is going to do is, you know, we kept all those big grain notes and yeast character in that first distillation. Now we're going to distill it again. The more you distill something, the more you're going to strip it out. So you're going to make a lighter, very light, soft style of whiskey. And this is what a lot of Canadian whiskey is known for, that light, soft style, double column distillation. There's uh, Dr. Don Livermore, our master blender. He's pulling a sample off that still. But what you're going to end up with after double column distillation is a light base whiskey. Sometimes we bottle them up um, by itself. It takes a little more aging, but, um, you know, just to show off some aging and give it some more flavor components because we've stripped those all out. But we also use it for our base whiskey and our blends. We're gonna strip out that grain character, strip out that yeast character, and we're going from 70% ABV now to 94, 95% ABV. So a very higher, high ABV um, on that double column distillation. And finally, we're gonna look at column and then pot distillation. Now this still is actually a little combo still that we use uh, for experiments and, and trials, but this is our pot still. This is the lot 40 still. We also pot still uh, wheat and barley through here. Again, it's 100% copper. Um, it is insulated on the outside and it's not a huge still. It's a 12,000 uh, liter still. We're doing 8,000 liter batches very, very slowly in that still. Now, Dr. Don's going to open this, uh, this is a gin still, an old gin still actually, but he's gonna open it up to show you the inside of this. So a pot still acts a lot like a pot of soup on the stove. And in the bottom of the still are these coils that you just saw, and that's what's gonna heat up the liquid. And then the vapors, once it, they get boiling, start to, you know, the liquid starts to vaporize off in different compounds are gonna come off at different temperatures. Just like when you're uh, making a pot of soup and the longer it goes, the more scents and different smells and odors kind of fill the house, same thing. Different flavor compounds are coming off or boiling at different temperatures. And this chart shows you, um, this was made for lot 40 actually, but this is the temperatures for all of these compounds no matter what you're making. So when we do a very slow distillation, um, for Law 40, we're doing a 12 hour distillation. And when you kind of compare that to um, other pot distillations like single malt scotch, right? They're all doing pot distillations um, and every distillery is very different. The process is very different, but you'll see a pot distillation typically between four to seven or eight hours, okay? We're slowing that way down, holding those temperatures longer. 
And the reason for this is because as the vapors come off, I've got, you know, one vapor coming off and then the next starting and then this one dissipates, but it's not like a clear line. This one stops and this one starts, you know, there's a little bit of something trailing off while something else is beginning. So the slower we can do that and the, the more that we can hold those temperatures, the more accurate we can make cut points. And so we like to make our cut points at Hiram Walker on this pot distillation because we can really hone in and concentrate up very specific flavors. Keep what we want, discard the rest, redistill it, use it in something else, um, but really concentrate the flavor components that we want in the whiskey. And here we're going from that 70% ABV in this, um, the column still, now up to 80% ABV. Okay, and finally, just a big take home before we get into our tastings is, now I mentioned this last week, I do like to compare because this is where a lot of our misconceptions come. But in Canada, when you look at recipe creation, when are the grains, the, the grain recipe, what are they going into this bottling? That's happening after maturation in Canada, for the most part. It's not regulated that it has to be done that way. You're just going to mostly see it done that way. Okay. And that's because for the most part, we're building 100% grain builds through production. Okay. In the US, for the most part, depending what style of whiskey you're looking at, you're going to see that recipe creation happening before or at the beginning of production, right? You're going to make your mash your mash bill, and that's where we're deciding how much corn, how much rye, how much barley, or whatever your recipe is, you're making that mash bill up front, and then you're putting that entire mash bill through the production process and coming out with one whiskey with, with different grains in it. So a couple of examples of what you typically see in Canada going into a bottling, possibly a corn whiskey, a rye whiskey, a wheat whiskey, maybe bottling up 100% rye, just one distillate, uh, or a very complex layered blend, okay? Like Dave tasted you all on Gooderham and Warts last week. This is that recipe. There's corn, rye, wheat, barley. There's a lot of different things going on here. Different woods, different distillation styles, et cetera, et cetera. And then typically what you're gonna see, you know, in the US, especially for bourbon or rye, uh, you'll typically see one mash bill, several barrels of that being blended together um, to create the bottling, right? So one recipe, several barrels of, of that one recipe going into one bottling. And that's why, now this is opinion, my opinion, but this is why I think um, we really market and talk about our master blender more than anyone in Canada. That is the face of our whiskeys, right? This is the person creating our recipes at the end of production. He's blending and, and Canadian whiskey is so well known for blended whiskey because we're creating that recipe from several different whiskeys. In the US, we tend to talk about our master distiller. That's the person making the recipe toward the beginning of the, the process, right? So, you know, it's just kind of like why we talk about specific people, but recipe is so important to everyone to know what's going into it and how much that um, we tend to market our whiskeys in that way. Okay, that said, I am going to pass it over to Dave to take us through two beautiful whiskeys uh, to show off this production process of 100% grain builds. Thank you, Gina. But before we do this, I think what, well, I'm going to, if I may, I'm going to suggest while I talk about these two whiskeys, you might want to look at all the brilliant questions, and there are many of them that came through. <laughs> okay. Now, okay. it was enough that I'm like, I am not stopping you in the middle of this. I lot, Amy will cover tomorrow. <laughs> some that I think we could present to Amy to make sure she covers it tomorrow. Uh, sure. But we'll take a look at those. And the other thing that I 
should mention, I know it was mentioned in the comments section, in case any of you didn't read, uh, the video Gina played of the distillery painting the mental picture of everything. There was no audio, but do not worry because it's just rock and roll music. There's no one talking. So you didn't miss anything except some loud guitars and drums playing. But uh, so you're good there. Uh, you just had to read. Sorry about that, everyone. I don't know what happened. It's not your fault, Gina Fawcett. Um, <laughs> let's get in trying some whiskey while you look at some of those questions and drink along. With All, right. All right. Uh, first up, gang, let's do this. What am I doing here? The JP Weiser's 18. Let's try some of that. This light styled corn whiskey. This, I always say when I'm talking about it, and I've been tasting this whiskey for 10 years with people. Drinking it longer than that as a consumer, customer, bartender, and it's one of the oldest expressions we've been making at the distillery. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about Angel Share and the barrels, and you're probably going to have a ton of questions. Keep in mind, that's all coming next week. When we're going to talk about barrels, you're going to have Dr. Don talking about his dissertation. Now, J.P. Weiser's 18, uh, one thing that we always bring up is where the distillery is situated. I think mean, Gina said it's the most southern tip of Canada. If you look on a map, it really is. It goes down to the bottom of the Great Lakes. We are so far south in Canada that if you want to go to Detroit, you have to drive north when you're in Canada to get to America. Um, and we're so far south that Detroiters, if you ever hear someone say South Detroit, or you hear in a song, South Detroit, a girl from South Detroit, that's Windsor. Windsor is South Detroit. It's a cute little nickname that Detroiters made for Windsorites. There's technically no South Detroit in Detroit. Um, so on that note, our summers, we get as warm as Louisville, Kentucky in the summer. We're to 35 degrees Celsius, 95 Fahrenheit in the summer months. It gets warm, but we're still Canada. And, you know, it goes to negative 40 Celsius, which that is where it actually meets up with Fahrenheit. Celsius and Fahrenheit meet up at negative 40. So think about that. And that's only a couple days a year it happens. That has not happened yet. Um, we do source all of our water from the Great Lakes. Any water we use from the Detroit River is non-contact. Uh, now, we use, with those temperature fluctuations, we lose about 3% angel share every year. So when you do the math, 1.6 million barrels, that's 48,000 barrels that just go away in the atmosphere. Uh, so it's pretty impressive. But you're going to learn a lot more about that with Dr. Dawn next week. Now, trying this whiskey, if you haven't already while I'm rambling on, looking at this beautiful, uh, it's like golden amber almost. I should say it's 40 ABV, 80 proof. Now this is the lightest style whiskey we have in our portfolio as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you get a lot of that rich oak. It is made from 100% double column distilled corn whiskey. Our lightest whiskey we make. So I get a lot of the Canadian whiskey cask is aged in. Your autumn florals, a little bit of green apple, which we'll get into next week. Yeah, but I get a lot of oak, the sweetness of the corn. You get a little bit of vanilla, the toffee caramel. Now, you'll see your first sip, it is soft. It's so soft. This is a perfect example of what double column distilled corn whiskey and aged Canadian whiskey casks. So you're right. Somebody just said this is blended whiskey, but it's 100% corn. It is 100% corn from a few different barrels that's blended together. Which again, your last week, you're going to have Dr. Don Livermore going very in depth on blending. So bring your notepads for that one. Mm -hmm. Now, sipping this too, you guys are already getting it. It's uh, soft, smooth. I get like 
not even green apple. I get baked apples from this. I get that rich caramel, that sweetness. It's so, somebody just wrote it, so silky smooth. That's exactly it. It's so silky and smooth. Now, it's an 18-year-old whiskey because law in Canada is we have to um, put on the label what the youngest blend is in the barrel. But one thing Gina and I talk about a lot is the price of it is, somebody said popcorn. It's kind of that buttery popcorn thing too. I like that. Uh, you can't be wrong with what you smell or taste. I think you all know that, but if you don't, you can't be wrong. Like we're all going to smell and taste different things. Um, what was I just saying, Gina? Uh, oh, you were just price. talking about buttered popcorn. The oh, price sorry. though, as an 18 oh. year old whiskey, most 18 year old whiskeys you find on the market are generally close to $200 a bottle. If you're finding a scotch or a bourbon. Um, and this is, Generally, depending on the state or province you live in, country, it's always under $70 a bottle. So it's really accessible. Whoops, I almost spilled it. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of people will often see the price and go, what's wrong with it? And say, nothing. We just have 1.6 million barrels of it laying down. There, and and just said. a... Yeah, touch on that blending. I was just going to touch on that blending comment uh, as well. You know, it's not regulated. We went over regulations last week. It's not regulated to label it blended whiskey, you know, when it's 100% of something. And you're going to see that the Lot 40 label does not say blended whiskey. Um, but this one does. It's really a choice of, of marketing and and the messaging that you're trying to reach with that consumer and and jp weiser's as a brand is known for its blended whiskey and they are blending barrels of corn whiskey like dave said so and someone just asked 70 canadian dollars i mean basically depending where you are it's under 70 in the u.s it's under 70 in canada so it just equals out if you're over in the uk it's about the same price um I don't give an exact date or a price because state to state, it varies a few dollars. Um, but yeah, this one, uh, you all remember last week when we had the bartenders, Evelyn, who had just written the book and did the Nutty Professor. She used to work for me at one of my spots years ago. And I always use uh, this as an example. She texted me one night and said, there's two guys at the bar and they're drinking all the JP Weiser's 18 year old. And I kind of, Text back, I'm like, great, like, what's the problem? And she goes, they're mixing it with Coke. And I was like, are they paying for it? She goes, yeah. I'm like, I don't care them. They can mix it with milk if they want. Like, just whatever blows their hair back. But point being, I think this is one that we suggest drinking on its own or over ice. But where it's so inexpensive, people do usually buy this whiskey. And sometimes they'll mix it with ginger ale or soda which I think is a waste, but it's pretty, uh, pretty accessible. Mm -hmm. corn, corn uh, between these two whiskeys, I'm going to hit uh, a couple of these questions between the whiskeys while okay. you're sipping. Uh, it was asked about, you know, using column, continuous column stills, um, but are any major producers producing light and flavoring whiskeys with pop stills. Um, you know, honestly, when you do a pot distillation, first of all, for us, we're doing a much smaller batch, but you would have to distill it over and over and over and over and over to get up to the ABV that you want and to really strip out um, the congeners. And you would Amy's going to get into tomorrow the line arm on the still where the vapors are coming out and which angle it's pointing and what that's going to do for your whiskey and the flavors. But the lighter style you want coming out of a pot still, you would angle that pipe, that line arm up so that some of it condenses on the piping or that line arm and falls back into the still and redistills until it finally comes out. Um, our line arm points down because we want a big, bold, heavy flavor. And so when that vapor is coming up in there, it's going to, if it condenses, it's going to trickle down, not go back into the still. But for the most part, you're not really making 
base whiskeys in a pot still. Can it be done? Sure. Is it efficient? No. Um, but our flavoring whiskeys, certainly, you know, our pot distilled rye, our pot distilled barley, pot distilled wheat, that's going to give us the, a lot of flavor to the blend. We're definitely doing some of those on the pot stills. Speaking of pot stills, would you like to go into Law 40? Sure. I was just looking at some of the comments. Some of the Jasmine wrote, some people want to watch the world burn. It's like, and I was like, oh, she's talking about the mixing with Coke. I like that. Uh, I think that's what she's talking about, at least. We'll see. Uh, so next up, we just did our lightest expression of the 18-year-old J.P. Weisers. Now we're going to go, how do I work this? We're going to go the other end of the spectrum for 100% rye whiskey. Now, I've got time to tell my little story, I think. I'm going to date myself here. Um, to lot 40 originally came out and hit the market in Canada and the U.S. in 1998. Now, I don't want to know where most of you were in 1998. I'm going to guess some of you weren't even born. That was the first year I started bartending. Um, now, you think back to 1998 and you think of pop culture and you think of drinks. We think of cocktails. It was a bit of a dark period for cocktails. I mean, everything was served in a glass shape like this. They were neon colored. They were fruity. They were juicy. It was liqueurs. It was sex in the city ruling the airwaves. Jasmine was five. Um, and <laughs> I'm just reading the comments. Everything was vodka cocktails. Um, remember, like, I guess some of you are not going to remember. Bourbon hadn't exploded yet around the world. Like, certainly Irish whiskey. If you asked a bartender in 1998 for a Jameson in North America, they usually looked at you like they didn't know what you were talking about. It just wasn't a huge whiskey world yet. Like, your grandfathers drank scotch and your uncles and dads would drink some Canadian whiskey, but it just wasn't a whiskey world. The cocktail, classic cocktails hadn't come back yet. So imagine in that time period when we released 100% rye whiskey. What do you think happened when we released 100% rye whiskey in the days of Cosmopolitan's purple hazes and vodka drinks? Yeah, there you go. Old fashions with the maraschino cherry. When we released this little 100% rye whiskey, it didn't go over so well. I mean, Canadian whiskey was known for being that light styled with a little pinch of rye. No one in Canada and in, in the U.S. really got it. 100% rye whiskey went over their heads. It was too big. It was too bold. Now, fast forward. So, sorry, I will tell you this because someone just reminded me saying they got dusty. The brand did so poorly that they just discontinued it and stopped making it and didn't keep the bottle at the distillery. And we have archives from 1857 and up. They just wanted to forget about it. They didn't keep a bottle of it. Now, fast forward, you know, we all know what happened in the early 2000s and I was proud to be part of it. You know, we started pulling out, a select few of us started pulling out all the old cocktail books in the late 1800s and early 1900s and bringing back View Carres and Manhattans and Old Fashions and Diamondbacks and all the classics, which called for gin and two types of whiskey, American rye or Canadian whiskey were the two whiskeys that were mentioned in all of these books. Bourbon explodes around the world. Irish whiskey explodes around the world. Japanese whiskey explodes around the world. London, England, and New York City and San Francisco bring back the classics. The rest of the world starts following suit. It took about 15 years to get it going, but it was happening. And I was part of that, and it was really exciting. So someone at our company, at Pernod Ricard, said, remember that whiskey that failed so miserably back in the late 90s? What if we brought it back? And this is where our now current master blender, Dr. Don, said, I'd like to take a shot at it. And he brought it back. And what it is, it is simply put, it's 100% unmalted rye. It is column distilled once, stripping away all the harsh qualities and characteristics from the grain and yeast. 
It is then pot distilled afterwards, and that still Gina was showing you for 12 hours and an 8,000 liter still. We discarded the heads and tails, getting rid of the green grass and soapy characteristics. And nothing's wrong with those characteristics. We just don't keep it for this whiskey. So we're left with the hearts, which are all your citrus, floral, rye bread, uh, baking spices, rise of big grain. Pot distillation really rounds it out. We then put it into brand new American oak, level two char. And that new American oak brings on the warming vanilla, sweet toffee and caramel. And we bottled it at 43 ABV or 86 proof. And the year we released it and the year after, it won Canadian Whiskey of the Year. So it was a matter of just over a decade watching palettes change and younger generations liking more complex whiskeys to where this has become a cult classic now. Uh, when I started this job, imagine 10 years ago and I went into the U.S. and focused on cocktail bars saying, I have a Canadian whiskey. A lot of people tried to slam the door on me. And uh, luckily, I had enough friends from working down there a lot. That they let me in and everyone really couldn't get over that this was a Canadian whiskey. But, I mean, I don't know if you've had it before. You might be drinking it now as I'm talking, but take a look at it. I mean, this is a really deep, deep amber color. Mm -hmm. 86 proof, as I said, 43 ABV. I mean, right away, you get the sour rye little bit of like pear. Somebody said red apple the other day. I mean, there's a warming honey sensation. That's for sure. And then you get a little bit of floral. You know, I find a lot comes out of this. Very complex. Uh, now, speaking of complex, to take your first sip. It's really smooth. It's complex. It's smooth. It's got body to it. It's round. One thing I love about American whiskey is it kind of punches you in the job. I love that. Great in cocktails. Higher proof. This, with the pot distillation, the new oak, it's it's kind of more of a slap. It wakes you up. Uh, but you can't tell me, even if you don't like Canadian rye, Canadian whiskey, this is a beautiful rye. It holds its own when you're making an Old Fashioned or a Manhattan. Uh, but yet, where it's got this soft elegance from the pot distillation, we watch bartenders in California and Texas in warmer climates, they're using it as poolside drinks. They're mixing it with sherries and bubbles and citrus and doing highballs. It's fantastic. Um, you know, sipping it, it's heavy rye, but it's still kind of soft and elegant. I like the mm -hmm. cinnamon gum. Yeah. Right up front, it's that that nice cinnamony spice is right up front, and then that all the warming, softer notes kind of come in after that. And someone's asking, yes, there is a. Um, they're asking about the cast strength. We did originally mm -hmm. we put out a twelve-year-old cast strength, an eleven-year-old. We've done different uh, ages. We've got this one that was just released on a small. Scale, it's a port finish. So it's a Law 40 cast strength at 53.1 ABV, but finished in port cast. Beautiful. It was a very small run. Um, run out. Someone's asking about this year. You're, you're not going to like this answer, but as soon as I hang up this call, Gina doesn't even know this. I'm going to sample the experiments of what's going to be released. There's one year. coming, I think, here. In 2024, word. Mm -hmm. there is one coming to Canada and the U.S. And mm -hmm. it's, I just don't think I'm allowed to say what it is, but it is a, it's a new cast strength with a really fun barrel finish that I wanted to come out before this port. So you will be seeing a new Lot 40 cast strength this year. Um, how are we doing on time? Let me get a couple of these. We got a few minutes, so let me let me hit a couple of these questions. Um, a couple I'm going to leave for Amy because I know she's going to go into depth tomorrow. But a few of these we can just hit right now. Um, one is about full loads of grain being turned away. Does that ever happen? Uh, yes, that is like I said. Uh, that is why Alice is behind bulletproof glass with a locked door. 
Um, because yes, full truckloads. If if the sample doesn't pass, the whole truckload doesn't pass. Um, so they are turned away. Now, like I said, they can go elsewhere um, to ethanol plants or with different quality uh, standards, but that definitely has happened. And man, every year I have to update this stat, but I think it was four or five years ago when, you know, it was so wet, it rained, you know, so much. Farmers had a hard time getting the crop out of the field. Um, and she rejected over 40% of the loads that came in that year. That was like a tough year. Uh, tough year to be her <laughs> or in that position for sure. Um, but, you know, we also had to source grain that year from Michigan, which is actually local to our distillery, but it's not local Ontario, like I said. So we, you know, we, we sourced it um, from elsewhere as close as we could to kind of fill the need. Um, but we, we do try to source locally as much as possible. But yes, full full uh, truckloads have been turned away. And someone asked, what's the largest amount that has been turned away? I do not know the answer to that, but we can certainly ask Amy tomorrow. She might know that. She she manages that um, part of the process. So she might, she might know that off the top of her head. She might have to go look it up. I don't know. But I don't know the answer to that specifically. Uh, someone asked for clarification on the sour mash process. So, you know, it is just using, it's as simple as using the leftovers from the previous batch. It goes all the way through distillation. And like I said, we're taking those vapors off, right? What the, the liquid comes to a boil, vapors come off. That's going into a condenser to turn it back into a liquid. But what didn't come out of that was the grain, the sludge. Um, and that is that is part of that sour mash process. We're also using that as, uh, and Amy's going to talk in depth about this tomorrow, but dried distiller's grain and wet distiller's grain, which is animal feed. There's lots of nutrients uh, in those leftover grains or those spent grains. And so that is, you know, we are trying not to waste at any part of this process. So that's being actually sold back to the market uh, as animal feed. So that is the sour mash process. So it is actually as simple as that. Someone asked about the yeast and if it we use a proprietary yeast. We do not. Right now we use a commercial yeast for our whiskeys. However, they are experimenting. Uh, they are working with some proprietary yeast. Um, for things to come down the road. And I know Don's going to get into that a little bit. He's got some of the old original yeast strains um, from Hiram Walker that he he has been taking care of um, for years. So he's going to get into that a little bit as well. Uh, as far as the water source, it is important. Um, but Amy's going to get in depth on that tomorrow and the process of um, filtering the water and what what it needs to be the standards that the, the water needs to come to so you know it, it doesn't matter if you get it from the great lakes or you get it from you know this beautiful stream i don't know in colorado or whatever uh it does matter if you if it can be filtered to what it needs to be to make whiskey so that it's not bringing components or things that will taint the whiskey, uh, flavoring components or whatnot with it, that you can strip any of those out. That's really important. That's why in Kentucky talks about limestone all the time because it's a natural filtration system. Uh, so that's that, that does a lot of the work for them, purifying that water. Uh, we are down to one minute, so I think I'm gonna leave it there. We will answer more questions tomorrow for our students. Um, and Amy has a lot to share. So uh, until then, everyone else, we will see you next week. I'm gonna pass this back to Liz. Amazing. Yeah, we have so, so, so many questions. Um, but like Gina said, um, 
Amy is going to get to those tomorrow for our students. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dave, Gina, and Ricky. Um, students, we will see you tomorrow at three in our Zoom classroom. Um, and then students and anyone else that joined us, uh, we will see you back here tomorrow or next week um, at 3 p.m. same time talking more Canadian whiskey. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for teaching. Um, and we will see you tomorrow, students. All right. Bye, Bye everybody.